I am also member of the committee of the Stulan Prize, <laughs> uh, and it's that capacity that it is my pleasure this year to wish you all welcome to this, uh, uh, we call it ceremony, uh, for the prize, Stulan Prize, which is generously then offered by Kjetil Stulan, and which has been, uh, I think, uh, I, this is my experience, a uh, great encouragement for the researchers at uh, NUPI. Uh, it, one of the problems for researchers is, is <laughs> effectively to be seen. And I think having a prize, having a, also what you will see later, a diploma, <laughs> is a way of really being seen. So um, thank you very much, Kjetil Stulon. This is the fifth prize, and we are really very, very glad for, for the, uh, to have this prize at NUPI. Uh, I will now uh, pass the word to Kjetil Stulon, who will have the honor of giving the prize to this year's one of this year's winners. <laughs> Please, Kjetil. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Kari. Um, it's been a privilege to be able to give this prize and uh, to this distinguished institute. Uh, and when the Jan Egland and Iver Neumann and myself discussed uh, the opportunity to institute a prize uh, some four, five, five years ago, Iver said, well, maybe we'll have chance to give prize for five years and uh, then there might be well if there are so many candidates we will be happy not happy but we'll we'll enjoy that uh, what we've seen that uh, the vast uh, resource uh, at NUPI would be definitely uh, able we could definitely be able to give a prize for another 5.5 years or five times five years to come anyway it's been a privilege Hopefully also encourage the researchers, uh, because research is, is such a difficult thing. At the same time, it is a privilege to be a part of it. I've been a researcher myself, uh, and uh, the difficulty is about being in the area where you are, where you're going both to secure the economy, when talking about research, very few, but the Research Council talks about the economy, but uh, secure the economy, at the same time, actually do the work in a limited time, and uh, at the same time, compete at the highest level of competence and knowledge. And that is a very tricky thing. You have to handle the three things at the same time. So, uh, this year's winners are two. And I, I asked uh, Ivra, how do you like that two of these candidates come with a PhD from Cambridge? He's coming from Oxford himself. He said, well, you know, sometimes we have to share. Um, the, um, the prize committee's um, text is in Norwegian and I won't do a direct translation, I have to read it directly in Norwegian. Kjell um, Stulans forskningspris for 2013 tildeles herve Elena Wilson Rowe, PhD Cambridge, og Indra Øvland, PhD Cambridge. Komiteen har i år valgt å dele prisen i det disse to yngre forskerne har parallelle karriereløp. Delvis overlappende interesseområder har arbeidet sammen og, spesielt viktig, står svært likt publiseringsmessig. Begge har publisert i topptidsskrifter på sine felt, og begge har en bred og anvendt publikasjonsliste. I mer spesialiserte tidsskrift, begge har skjøttet sine borgerplikter ved instituttet godt, ikke minst har begge nettopp utgitt solide bøker. Elena om russisk klimapolitikk på Palgrave forlag, Indra, med Mikkel Berg som anforfatter på Berghan. Komiteen gratulerer, og det gjør jeg også. Så Indra, kan du komme opp her? Skal du motta pris? Dette er ditt diplom. Og her står det Norsk utenrikspolitisk institutt. Og så står det da ditt og eh, Elena sitt navn. Gratulerer. Some flowers, a very easy little book. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Elana, we should also tell you that Elana is in the United States. She has just given birth to twins uh, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> so she's a, a prize winner, triple prize winner.
and she will not be back, so of course she Both of us have been working together on the Ruskas project, which has lasted for six years, five years plus a small extension, um, and which has been important not just for the two of us, but also for, for uh, very many of the people at NUPI, most of the people at NUPI, are working on the former Soviet Union. Uh, and it has really helped to keep our uh, research group or, or, or milieu um, working over the past uh, years. <clears throat> now, to my presentation. Um, I, I was. I thought I was going to present on Norwegian, so the, the the slides are actually in Norwegian, but I'll speak English. But I, I don't think it'll make a very much of a difference. Uh, there isn't a lot of text, and most of the text is, is uh, reasonably uh, international. Um, I could have presented, or perhaps should have presented, on some of the work that I have done over the last years, uh, on energy issues in the former Soviet Union, uh, on uh, Gazprom and competing cam companies. <clears throat> on the business climate for foreign companies in Russia, on the emissions of climate gases from uh, LNG versus pipelines, uh, very interesting research, but also very technical, and about renewable energy in Russia. But I think that many of these topics uh, would be a little bit too narrow for what is a very highly educated and very competent audience, but also a very diverse audience. So, instead, I have chosen to speak about a global topic uh, which I have not published on yet, but which I am thinking of publishing on in the future. So this is work in progress. <clears throat> I also thought that geopolitics would be a good topic because Elana is a geographer, and obviously there's a lot of, ge of geography in geopolitics. And uh, one of the subtopics here is Arctic geopolitics. And it's something that both Ilana and I have separately published articles on. And we've also written two uh, proposals, project proposals, uh, on this topic uh, together in the past. <clears throat> so uh, it's, uh, although this is, uh, although you can't blame Ilana for any of the weaknesses in what I'm going to present, uh, there are some uh, linkages here to her. We are becoming more and more people uh, on this earth, and that has contributed to changing the relationship between supply and demand for oil. The historical uh, industrialized countries increasingly have to share the resources with the emerging economies. And there seems to be quite a clear connection, as this graph shows, between the development in the emerging economies and the oil price. And this trend leads to a lot of worries, has led to a lot of worries, about a rising oil price, about energy security, and about potential geopolitical conflict over energy resources. <clears throat> and there have been many uh, events over the, especially the last 10 years, but also the last 20 years, which can be interpreted into this perspective, this geopolitical perspective of competition over petroleum resources. <clears throat> and this has also been reflected in uh, uh, a, a considerable growth in the amount of academic and media uh, academic publications and media reports uh, on geopolitics and especially geopolitical competition over petroleum resources. This graph here shows the development from 1980 to 2012 uh, in the top ranked, the 10 top ranked journals in political science and the 10 top ranked journals in geography. So this is also kind of a bit of Ilana and a bit of Indra. Uh, and we see a very clear trend towards more publishing on geopolitics. <clears throat> and of course, this is a, 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 a large and diverse literature, <clears throat> but one part of it is um, very much sees uh, impending resource competition uh, as a very uh, serious threat to stability in the world. And especially people like uh, Michael Clare, um, 
who's published a lot of books on this and uh, made quite a lot of money on those books, I think. And the company Stratfor, which some of you may get emails from, um, which also may be in other parts of the world. Uh, but this graph here is quite interesting. It's a very loose estimate from the British Geological Survey, but it shows this line here, which you can hardly see, is the annual gas consumption of the UK. The red line, which is, or column, which is a little bit higher, taller, is its conventional reserves. <clears throat> the green column, which is many, many times larger, is the UK's onshore shale gas reserves. And the purple column is its offshore shale gas. So the UK, these are uncertain reserve, uh, estimates, but potentially a country like the UK, and there are many other countries like Poland, uh, Ukraine, China, <clears throat> and so on, may have very, very large reserves of shale gas. We don't know if these are extractable, we don't know what it would cost to extract them and so on, but there is a picture here um, which may mean that th there isn't so much scarcity as was, as was thought. And what's happening right now is not only shale gas, but shale oil has ha is happened even more recently, but is developing even more, even faster. <clears throat> so far, mainly in the US again, uh, with growth between 2004 and 2011 of 26% per year. And while uh, the technology for shale gas developed, uh, you could say spontaneously, through small companies taking a lot of risk, <clears throat> a lot of the big companies don't want to come in late and buy in uh, at a high price in shale oil, so a lot of the investment is coming a lot faster and heavier in shale oil. So there's promise for the future, although there are also a lot of arguments against uh, booms in shale gas and shale oil. <clears throat> but there are also other resources, and one of the more wild resources is gas hydrates. This is gas which is frozen under very low uh, temperature, at very low temperatures and very high pressure. Uh, some of it is in permafrost areas in the Arctic. Um, and some of it is on the sea bottom in different parts of the world, usually quite deep seas. Um, and again, estimates are very uncertain, but it has been estimated that, there is, that the world has as much resources in gas hydrates as it has in oil, gas, and coal combined. As of today, it's possible to extract this, but it costs a lot of money. It's not economic, economically viable. Um, but the main point I want to make under this second argument about the counter-argument <clears throat> is precisely that the relationship between the cost of extracting something, the technology, the geological resources, and the politics that facilitate uh, the interaction between these is very dynamic. And that's why estimates of future oil prices or future gas prices are so difficult to make, because it's a very unstable ground to work on, and <clears throat> it's impossible to, to predict which changes will come about. And um, gas hydrates is one of those things. It may never happen, or it may happen very fast, uh, and it may have a huge impact on supply and demand of oil and gas in the world, and thus on the politics of oil and gas. So that was my the second argument I wanted to briefly lay out. <clears throat> but those two arguments are not what I'm going to talk about today. I want to talk about a third argument, which is that <clears throat> even if these two first arguments are wrong, even if unconventional oil and gas are not going to change the picture, even if this whole climate renewable thing blows over, and we're stuck here with the oil and gas that we have, the conventional resources, <clears throat> I want to argue that geopolitical comp the, 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 w some of the most common understandings of how this plays out in terms of geopolitical competition are not very helpful. And the rest of this presentation is about that. So before going into this, I need to, we need to define geopolitics. In cooperation with colleagues, I've collected 57 different explicit definitions of geopolitics, which I'm not going to go through uh, right now. 
<clears throat> and there are, of course, a lot more uh, implicit understandings, and the implicit understandings are sometimes uh, the more interesting understandings. But if we have a valuable natural resource, very important to the, those two countries, <clears throat> could be defined as geopolitics, but I think I would like to be a bit more narrow. And I'll come to my own definition in a moment. I'll just look at this fourth group, which is people who think, or authors who think of geopolitics as any, and here we're of course zooming in on oil and gas, which is my area of interest, any political factors which have an influence on the oil market and the price of oil. I and mean, if you read the business newspapers and an interview with interviews with people who trade oil, very often they'll use the word geopolitics or geopolitical, and what they're talking about is a uh, possibility of a coup in a country in the Middle East, without any, although of course sometimes that can sometimes be linked to um, powers outside the region, that's not what they have in mind. <clears throat> They're just thinking about any form of politics that influences the oil price. It could also be, uh, for example, changes in regulations in an oil exporting country, changes in the tax regime. And as a political scientist, I think, well, why not to say politics instead of geopolitics? Because there's nothing really geo or geographical about this. Okay, so how would I define geopolitics? <clears throat> I would define geopolitics as competition between great powers over natural resources which have a specific location and which are important for the secure the strength of those great powers, the military strength of, of those great powers and their security, and the future competition between them. This understanding, I believe, is consistent with the classics on the air, in the area who are often quoted but rarely used, or sometimes used but abused. Hope I'm not abusing them. <clears throat> and the way they thought about uh, geopolitics, some of them at least, is was closely associated with the colonial race. In the case of Africa, the scramble for Africa and for African resources. <clears throat> and in this race, access to natural resources and to strategic loca locations was a very important aspect of a continuously expanding competition. <clears throat> so, one of the great advantages of Britain was that it was, it, it had the upper hand at, uh, <clears throat> on the seas, it had a stronger navy, better ships, and so on. And this enabled it to get access to strategic colonies, which then enabled it to get access to resources, which then enabled it to get access to other strategic colonies, and so on and so forth. And this has very, this geopolitical game was very real. It existed, it was played out, and the success of Britain is why I'm speaking English today in this lecture. That's why English is a world, is the world language <coughs> today. Under the First World War and the Second World War, geopolitics became, if possible, even more important. So when the First World War started, the military planners focused on the horse as the primary mode of transportation. And it was assumed that you needed one horse for every three men. <clears throat> and when Britain entered the war, it had about 800 motor vehicles, most of which were had confiscated from private citizens. By the end of the war, Britain had 56,000 trucks and 36,000 cars, and the US had built 15,000 planes in one and a half years. So there was a whole transformation of the geopolitical game because all of these planes and vehicles needed oil. <clears throat> and again, the British had great advantage from strategic choices they had made, especially at seas. In 1911, Churchill had shifted the British Navy from coal to oil, 
which was a very risky move at the time. And in 1914, the British state became the majority, majority shareholder in the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, which is what is known today as BP. And I think that a lot of the people, especially journalists, but also quite a lot of academics who write and think about geopolitics, forget this. They write as if oil were an important military strategic asset. And for example, they would refer to the bombing of uh, diesel tankers going through Pakistan for Afghanistan, which is very um, important. I mean, almost all of the fuel for the forces in Afghanistan has had to be imported, or all has to, had to be imported. It's very expensive. It involves risks. But that doesn't mean that it's geopolitically uh, important. It's a nuisance. It's not uh, strategically decisive. What deci determines the outcome of the campaign in Afghanistan isn't access to oil. <clears throat> And this may seem like semantic uh, nitpicking, perhaps. But being clear about what kind of competition we have over petroleum resources has important implication for how this competition plays out and for how the markets develop and how the price of oil develops and for what it makes sense for countries and for companies to do in relation to oil. And it means that these problems ultimately are likely to be tackled in other ways than this way. <clears throat> so, what does that mean? Does that mean that there's no geopolitical competition or international competition over oil and gas? Well, since geopolitics is about geography and places, then per definition, if there's great geopolitical competition over petroleum resources in the world, then it must be focused on some geopolitical press points. So let's quickly scan a few of these assumed press points. And this is also some of the starting point for this presentation. <clears throat> in that I have worked specifically on this one and this one, since I work on the former Soviet Union, uh, and Ilana has also worked on this one and published. We've both published on Arctic uh, geopolitics. So if we deal with, look at the Arctic first, <clears throat> there are various uh, uh, assumed... Um, locations of geopolitical tension and competition. Um, we could probably, s probably start with the symbolically most important one, that's the North Pole. <clears throat> and I showed on very, one of the very first slides a uh, Russian titanium flag on the bottom of the North Pole, which I think is one of the more uh, misunderstood uh, acts of uh, Arctic policy and misinterpreted acts of Arctic policy in recent years. Because Russia, like Norway, and Canada and Denmark, Greenland have all signed the law of the seas and ratified it. <clears throat> and they are all, uh, um, the, the, the Arctic policy of all of these countries is um, geared towards working within the law of the seas. <clears throat> and the only basis that could give a right, some kind of territorial right over the North Pole is precisely the law of the seas. So any country operating outside the law of the seas wouldn't have a particularly strong claim or wouldn't really have any basis at all for their claim uh, to the North Pole in the modern world. Another area of conflict is the boundary line which goes about here between the US and Canada in the Beaufort Sea, where they have a similar a discussion which is very similar to the discussion which was resolved in 2010 between Norway and Russia. But again, it's difficult to imagine the Third World War between Canada <coughs> and the US, 
oil or no oil. Another area is Svalbard, where there are slightly different interpretations <coughs> of the implications of the Svalbard Treaty. Now, this doesn't seem so impressive. If we go to Latin America and Africa, <coughs> there is competition, but this competition is played out through high bids for oil fields and uh, different types of bids from Chinese, uh, Russian, uh, Western oil companies, and so on and so forth. In the South China Sea, <coughs> there are territorial conflicts, which are geographical, between China and its neighbors, and there are expectations of finding large oil and gas reserves, and the US is increasingly becoming involved through its pivot to Asia, and the possibility of strengthened military presence uh, among, uh, in China's neighboring countries. However, the US isn't there to get hold of the oil for itself. It's there as part of a competition with China, but not over oil. For China, the oil is important. For the other countries, the oil is important. But it's a bit more like uh, one of these con conflicts I, I mentioned earlier, for example, Bhutan and Nepal. Um, it's, it's important for those countries involved. It involves one great power very directly. But most of the other countries are not um, major actors in the world. <clears throat> and the US is involved, but again, not, that's not driven mainly by oil, in my interpretation at least. And finally, we get to the Persian Gulf. And this, I believe, is the closest you get to a genuine geopolitical hotspot. 17 million barrels of oil pass through the Strait of Hormuz at the entrance to the Gulf every day. And there's a heavy American presence. And as we all know, there has been over many decades many uh, American and other Western military interventions in the region. Perhaps most famously of all, the war in Iraq which is often ascribed, thought of as part of a geopolitical competition. <clears throat> Ordered or led by George W. Bush, with a background from oil companies, father has a background in oil companies, on the basis of trumped up char claims about weapons of mass destruction, this would seem to be the ultimate candidate for a, a real geopolitical conflict. Other people disagree with this and argue that the US was driven by a desire to promote democracy or misled, but nonetheless a genuine desire to stop weapons of mass destruction or even by some kind of um, evangelical urge, it has been argued. And my argument on this, or view on this, is that it's not really easy to, to pin the war in Iraq on any particular reason. And that really goes for most foreign policy uh, actions. <clears throat> and my approach to this, which is loosely, very loosely inspired by Graham Allison's third explanatory uh, model in The Essence of Decision, what I take from there is, is a kind of a, a splitting up of the assumed unitary actor of the nation state into many different levels. <clears throat> and this is a very, the, the numbers here are totally random. Um, they're just f for the sake of exemplification because it's empirically almost impossible to actually prove this. But this is how I think uh, we can understand, understand that things work. You have Within a country, you have some very powerful actors like the president and the government and military generals and so on. But you have very many of them and you also have very many other actors who influence them in turn. So we have actor one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Many, many, many different actors. <clears throat> and some of these will be groups, some of these are individuals and so on. And they can have different aims. or th There are different potential aims. For example, the promotion of democracy. And different actors can have a different, uh, let's call it a strength of desire 
associated with each of these aims. So for some actors, it's very important to generally promote democracy. For some other actors, it's not so important. Yet other actors don't care at all or against it. And so on with all these different potential motivations. You have different, and the alliances between them also matter, both the formal alliances between political parties and so on, but also many more informal alliances and overlaps between different groups and their views. So that means that this, what we could call a porridge, that determines what <clears throat> nation states do, is very complex, very co unpredictable, and I would say clearly cannot be easily boiled down to some kind of simple geopolitical logic. And as far as the war in Iraq is concerned, it means that oil may have played a role in a complex picture for some actors, <clears throat> but it's, it clearly cannot be some, uh, yeah, c cannot have some very dominant uh, and, and uh, one-sided influence. So, a lot of this geopolitical game is imagined. <clears throat> but what if many different actors in many different countries imagine the same game? Do you then, although you don't need oil to, although great, uh, although major states which, states which do compete internationally, don't need oil anymore to compete with each other because at the moment they have a direct military confrontation we have nuclear Armageddon and everything is over <clears throat> so although oil is therefore not directly relevant for their direct uh, competition if they imagine that it is can we then still have a geopolitical race and I think we can to some extent and to some extent, that's what we have, because many actors in many of these countries imagine this. So they feel that we are, they are part of a geopolitical game, and they try to contribute to it. And sometimes they manage to make, through the porridge, they manage to, to contribute to some initiative <clears throat> with a geopolitical logic. <clears throat> but it's very expensive. And this is my last slide. Many, a lot of the kind of a kind of a subtopic of geopolitical thinking is that both those who are for support the U.S. and who are more critical of the U.S. think that the U.S., which has 600 military bases in the world, <clears throat> has all this military uh, strength to secure the oil, cheap oil, for its economy. But I would like to throw out a different possible interpretation, which is that the relationship is the other way around. The US has a very strong economy for very many different reasons, historical, cultural, demographic, <clears throat> and therefore it has the possibility to have such a strong military and go, go around doing the things it does. So it's kind of a resource curse. They have a very, they're blessed with a very strong economy and they are free to waste it on the military. Because there are no white spots left on the map to occupy, you can occupy a country, but you have to leave sooner or later. <clears throat> you can throw out undemocratic governments, but it doesn't secure, guarantee that you get access to the oil in that country in the long term. Look at the success of Russian and Chinese oil companies in Iraq at the moment. They're doing very well. And of course, it's attractive to have access to oil economically. But ultimately, it's a bit like mobile phones or refrigerators. It's attractive to produce a lot of it and sell and that everybody buys it from you. Uh, and it's good for your country and good for your economy. And in the long term, that has some influence on your national security and your military strength. But it doesn't have the direct decisive role that it had during the Second World War and before. 
And one possibility is that those countries down here may be getting some advantage out of the fact that they are not playing the geopolitical game so actively <clears throat> and in the same way that already which because there is some some literature on this already usually regionally <coughs> rather than globally uh, but it'll be interesting to see but uh, um, so thank you Heidi for the question and I agree with you I think uh, fridges and cell phones I, I thought of that right now uh, was uh, were bad examples uh, so let me let me let me instead uh, suggest fish and hydropower which are location specific um, or timber could be added which are location specific and can make you a lot of money um, but uh, don't necessarily determine the world order and the success of your empire. Uh, my name is Ulf. <coughs> Sorry. My name is Ulf Sverre so, uh, Thank you for this lecture and congratulations with the prize to you and to Elana. Um, I think uh, you presented lots of stuff in the in this lecture. Uh, some of the things are I find a bit more convincing than the others. So, uh, uh, so I'll just make a few simple points. Uh, first is that I think that uh, it's it was very elegant in the way you put it forward. Uh, but it, uh, I just wonder if you kind of put in a definition that maybe somehow brought you back to a place where you could kind of solve the problem by doing it in a simple fashion. Because obviously everybody would agree that uh, since you have nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, then this is the ultimate uh, way of reasoning. But uh, everybody at the same time know that still uh, countries are, are engaged in violent uh, affairs of high or low intensity without the use of nuclear weapons, so you use conventional weapons. But that's the simple issue. But I think that in terms of geopolitics, um, uh, the struggle between wars, uh, not been between countries, also has to be with uh, access to economic resources. And after all, uh, uh, oil is fairly strongly linked to economic growth. And uh, economic power shifts uh, are also related to political power shifts. So I find it a bit strange that you take those aspects out of the equation somehow. And that's the first point. That is, and the second point relates to these uh, convention, uh, the, the first two slides, or the two arguments you said you don't want to pursue on, on the renewables and, and the unconventional or titles. I think that um, the, this is, I'm a complete amateur on this, but my understanding is that, of course, access to energy, access to uh, kind of stable deliverance of energy and also at a fair price is, of course, critical. Some of these two energ energy sources, both the renewables and the tight oil, are, as I see it, hard to get to. They are quite costly. And we are now experiencing kind of increased uh, access of those resources, but partly due to the fact that the global economy is kind of, you have a very low interest rate and lots of capital available. And I just wonder if you put in the financial side to these, to the renewables and the unconventional, how would that play out? Kind of if you, kind of if you look into the price factor, what if you have less available capital. Okay. That's a bit of a challenge. <coughs> Thank you, Ulf. Um, I think, uh, as I try to argue, I think a lot of other definitions of geopolitics are not really very useful because they are so broad that they co cover virtually everything. For example, all, geograph all geography and all uh, politics. And I think also that um, to be true, I think both to be true to the classics, to some extent, although they would take quite a, a they would have a dynamic view on this, so they would see also smaller countries as competing uh, geopolitically, but ultimately they're interested in, in, in um, how countries gain the, the upper hand in the race to become uh, to become greater, um, which isn't really possible. I mean, a, a country like 
um, Liechtenstein can't kind of expand, expand, expand through empire nowadays. So nowadays the great countries, the dominant countries, are going to be uh, the great powers. So I think in in that sense, it it's more true to the traditional literature, and it makes more sense. The official discourse continues: is that the U.S. believes in a free market for everything, including energy, and that's in the best interest of everybody. And that's why the U.S. wants to um, liberate uh, uh, certain countries and certain transportation routes and secure them as uh, a part of the joint supply of the world. And that, of course, can sound a bit lame, but it, and I'm not sure if it's, again, as you saw with all the, my kind of table of all the US actors, I don't know if they, if they all believe in it, but it does actually make some sense. Because uh, oil is a commodity that has a price on the world market. And although you can get more, I mean, you can get more access to it somewhere or somewhere else, it still has the same price. Okay, some places you can get a special deal. So that's the best you can get. But ultimately, the value is the same. And the cost, so maybe very good for your oil company, if, say, so say if ExxonMobil could get very big oil contracts in Iraq, instead of DNO getting those contracts, which is some of what's happening now <clears throat> in Kurdistan. Um, but let's say that ExxonMobil got all those big contracts. That would be great for ExxonMobil, that's for sure. Um, would it be great for American consumers? Would they, they for, to be great for American consumers, the American government would have to then force ExxonMobil to sell the oil cheaply to American consumers. Now that's not going to happen, first of all. And second of all, if it did happen, it's a subsidy, it's an implicit subsidy. Which means that you're you are forcing ExxonMobil to subsidize oil by taking a lower price than it could have otherwise got on the world market f um, per barrel. <clears throat> and that means that the advantage to the US, apart from ExxonMobil as a company, would be limited. And as it is today, ExxonMobil doesn't have some huge advantage in Iraq anyway. And the advantage seems to be declining also uh, every year. So, uh, but then what about, yeah, as I, as I you also asked, um, what if there is, this is, uh, you've gone right to the heart of the most difficult aspect of this uh, discussion. Uh, so I, um, I don't think my answers are very, very strong. They're a bit rambling. I'm sorry about that. This is a work in progress, as I said. Um, and even more so on the last part of your question, on the financial side of the other arguments against geopolitics. So, um, what if the capital available for renewable energy and for unconventional oil and resources, what if there's less uh, capital uh, available? And to be honest, I'm not quite sure how that would play out. But what I, and I'm not sure what I can say, though, is that I'm not sure if anybody else knows either. Because if you change that side of the equation, you're going to change a lot of other sides of the equation. For example, you may have a much lower oil price, price then for, for um, conventional oil. Um, and also, as a, the, I was trying not to go too far into that. I was just trying to acknowledge the, that there exist these other arguments, but I wasn't trying to actually to run through the whole thing. <clears throat> But um, what I did try to nonetheless kind of just briefly say is that the relationship between the how much resources you have available geologically, which is not an objective fact, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, on the basis of scientific estimates, and there have been some incredible changes in quite, and they, they, these changes have been going on for 200 years. I mean, there were scares in the 1880s when the world was totally going to temp empty out for oil and the price went up a hundred times uh, and there was a kind of a, a horror that there would be no more oil left. And so these things happen on off, but then a new technology comes along uh, and everything changes. So different prices, different world, different demand and supply, new finds, new technology, I don't know. Thank you, Indra. When you uh, 
sit in a committee that awards the prize, you're always a bit nervous when the prize winner takes the floor because if he falls flat on his face, it reflects extremely badly on the committee. In this case, we uh, are breathing easily over the committee card. And one of the reasons for that is that you are asked wide-ranging questions instead of sort of sitting in a corner talking about the technicalities that we all research. You, you approach the whole thing. Um, and I want to challenge you that. Why are we so interested in China? Because it expands its area of operations so that it can push buttons, for example, in Africa and shape the system. When it couldn't do that, we were not that interested. It wasn't really a geopolitical player in the same way. It was a regional player. And uh, this systemic thing and the great power thing has to be more evolved, I think, at the very beginning of the, uh, of the think piece before you can publish it. And by the way, since we're in Norway, I think it goes along, this aspect of geopolitics goes a long way to understanding why small powers are always so skeptical of geopolitics. Because you talk, when you talk about geopolitics, you immediately and automatically assume the perspective of, on the world of great powers. Because they are the ones who have it in their power to shape the system. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eva. Thank you and thank you. <coughs> Um, I can only say that I agree, and I, I think that's a, uh, a good point for me to add to my definition, is that it has a, a global systemic quality. Uh, one could imagine a world in which one actor believes it's in a geopolitical situation and acts accordingly, uh, but then you wouldn't have a geopolitical race. Then you'd have a small, a few uh, strange moves, but no geopolitical race, and maybe to some extent that is what we have uh, in some ways, <clears throat> uh, sometimes, uh, nowadays. But yes, I, I agree. Uh, the systemic part should be part of the definition. Next question, please. My name is Ali uh, First of all, thank you for the interesting lecture. And I would like to share a reflection with you and with the audience because um, I've been uh, active in various aspects of the Norwegian petroleum activities since the middle of the 1960s. While we have been sitting here an hour and a quarter, several million Norwegian crowns, petro crowns, have been created and also added to the petroleum fund. And by the middle of 2015, on this fund there will be 5,000 billion a week credit, which is similar to 1 million per person. Give another 15 years, and it will be close to 10,000. Would you consider, let's say, geoeconomics, as uh, we've talked about, adding to geopolitics? being actually an increasing element in geopolitical considerations to be made for future generations. So that geopolitics in the future is not only necessary in areas of conflict, but it is the harvesting of this particular natural resource and the way it's being used, which will then add Geopolitical, geopolitical considerations. I, for one, would also like to have geotechnology. Less than 50 years ago, there was no offshore technology developed to actually find oil and gas. And when you look at it from a scientific, technological point of view of the last 40 years, it, in my mind, has added to potential geopolitical considerations. Um, so, I understand, stood your question a little bit. I may have misunderstood, but I... And, of course, also, mm. sort of a question whether you could open up for a broader definition of geopolitics. <coughs> And in a sense, maybe the underlying question could also be whether Norway's increased uh, wealth, and especially its savings, um, 
could enable us or make us play some kind of greater political role in the world. And I'm not so sure about that. I think, and this is my own personal view, of course, and I think others may disagree, but <clears throat> I think um, I think that uh, these savings, which are indeed per capita very, very big, uh, will probably influence the role that Norway plays in the wor in officially to protect uh, Norwegian Arctic areas. Um, it's a bit like the 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 point I made on the U.S. I'm not sure if we're doing this to protect our interests or whether we're doing this just because we have the money and we need to spend it on on something. I'm not sure if it's a very good investment for Norway's strategic uh, interests. Um, I would think that uh, one of Norway's main strategic interests <clears throat> or best way of protecting Norwegian strategic interests if one wants to think along the line of strategic interests is to stay out of a lot of things. To support some good causes and then stay out of a lot of other things. Okay. Okay. Next question. <coughs> I work here at the NUP. Um, uh, first of all, congratulations uh, on the prize um, and a very good presentation. The question that uh, I think emerges here, at least for me, is one that may be difficult for you to answer now, but still. Um, what is it that great powers are competing over? Because you have taken resources geographically specific resources out of the equation, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the next question then, because I am, I am in to total agreement with you of the overblown characteristics and intensity of this so-called geopolitical competition, but what is it that the US and China, for example, and others are competing for or over, in your view? I think to some extent they're competing out of old habit and according to a logic of old habit and that's precisely why I want to talk about this um, because not only in the academic literature, not only in the media but also in state behavior there is some of this behavior so this is this imagined geopolitical race that I was talking about at the end. So I think that at least some actors in these countries think that they're competing over resources which are valuable and they think are therefore strategically important and important for their security. And they are important, I mean, there is such a thing as energy security, which I think really exists, but it's, it's a collective security, because it's one global oil market. <clears throat> so some people in, in these uh, powerful countries think along these lines, I think, so I'm partly, I'm, I'm trying to help them. Um, Others, uh, other aspects of, of contem contemporaneous uh, competition is for, is for prestige, for recognition and respect. And uh, you can formally see the, the, mm -hmm. the, the pleasure on the faces of American actors being invited back into the Philippines, welcomed very warmly to Japan and South Korea and even to Vietnam. Uh, as kind of guarantors of their security. Uh, and I think that's very nice for the US. Um, and I think China is a potential threat for those countries surrounding it. So uh, for those countries, although I think it's very unlikely to see a real war there, <clears throat> but I can understand that it's, um, it's, it's nice for those countries to have some American protection as, as much smaller countries than China. Um, yeah, so I think status, um, prestige, and uh, finally, economic advantage. But it's not a loop, because I think the whole difference, or it's, the loop is a lot weaker. Because I think in a colonial race, the loop is very direct. You control the Straits of Gibraltar, you control, you control the Suez Canal, or the Cape of Good Hope, uh, and so on. <clears throat> You have access to iron to build your railways and coal to, for your ships and um, rubber to, build, to make tires and so on. And that allows you to gain, to get hold of India 
and then with India you can get hold of Afghanistan, and then with Afghanistan you can get hold of Central Asia, but then somebody's coming from the other side. So this is the great game. <clears throat> Where it, it, there's a very direct and strong, what you could call an immediate loop, and that resources and control over locations play into your continuing strength. Um, uh, so I think today, the final aspect of competition is, is the economic competition, which is basically for wealth, which feeds to some extent into your 